to go. Do I have, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, so, um, I'm really pleased to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor Vibar Cregan Reid. Uh, Vibar is an author, academic, and broadcaster who's written widely on the subjects of literature, health, nature, and environment. And his most recent uh, book, *Primate Change: How the World Is Making uh, Is How the World We Made Is Remaking Us*, asks how modern life is changing our bodies. And this is the avenue through which I got to know his work. So I'm not holding this up as a plug, but simply because it's a book that I read uh, about a year ago that had a really profound impact on my life. Um, so I would say that I think he's a fantastic person to come and talk to us today. Um, and for me, climate change wasn't a bit, just a good read, but it was, uh, it really hammered home the point uh, that nearly all of the time when we think about self-care, it's not about relaxing and sitting on the sofa um, after a long day at work. It's really about getting out, up, getting outside, getting active and getting involved in whether it's nature, going for a run um, and how important those things really are. And they're quite easy to forget about. Now, we know as a sector what the benefits of not nature are for health, for well-being, um, and for, for our, obviously our physical health. Um, but it's more difficult to actually achieve as a sector. So, um, so what are the next steps? What, what's the impact? Uh, and this is some of what we're going to explore this session. So I would like to hand over now to, um, to Professor Cregan Reid. Um, and if we can all just uh, join me in, uh, in welcoming him. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today about, about these ideas. Um, so this comes from, uh, this project comes really from uh, a, a, a book and a, a few radio programs that I did for the World Service. And it's really about, about modern life. Um, modern life is, is great. We get lots of wonderful things out of it. You're all sat in plush, lovely, comfortable chairs. We're in a centrally heated environment. Um, uh, we live longer than we used to. Uh, we're well, very well taken care of. <coughs> we have um, we have vegan ginger cake. We have gravy. You know there are many advantages to to modern life. But um, one of the things that that really started me off with um, this um, project was the fact that well, to be honest, it was because I was so ill. But um, it's the fact that as a, as a species, we don't seem to be doing very well in modern life. So in the US, 70, uh, about 70% 70 of people are on prescription medication. If you put the pills end to end, it would go around the world twice, and you'd actually have enough left over to do an additional Atlantic, Atlantic crossing. And in the UK, uh, we don't do much better. We have um, uh, about 50% of people on prescription medication. I think about 2% is, is what I take, but everything else is on, is on you. Um, <clears throat> so it's almost as if our bodies aren't really very comfortable with, with, uh, with modern life at all. And it's because we've gone through quite a lot of change. Um, we've gone through an awful, awful lot of change um, within, within the space of a few generations. Now, um, in terms of human time, in terms of personal time, in terms of personal histories, a generation feels like quite a long time to us. You know, a generation or two is, for some of us, our entire, entire lifetime. But for human DNA, for the human body, it, uh, you know, the time works a little bit differently. So to give you some idea, you know, if this, was, if this is where humans get up on two feet, if this is where humans get up on two feet, this edge of the screen, and then we go through, um, let's say, Homo habilis, uh, Homo erectus, and then some Homo uh, gaster and Heidelbergensis, and then you probably get to uh, Homo sapiens about here. Is that right? Yeah, probably about here. And then you get to Homo sapiens sapiens, you know, so wise we had to name ourselves twice. Uh, uh, about, uh, yeah, probably about here. Now, if you have a quick look around you, do really actually look around you and try and spot something in the room that isn't as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Now, the keen-eyed among you will spot two things. One is other humans. One is other humans. No, no, the banister's varnished. The banister counts. <laughs> um, one is other humans, and, and two is uh, plants. Um, but I'm not aware of a, um, 
Does anyone know what this one's called? Arthosplenum or something? I've never seen one of these growing in the wild in the UK. So the plants, these are tropical plants. These have been brought here. Uh, are they even real? They look real. They don't look very healthy, do they? <laughs> yeah, they must be real. Um, Kentia palm? That's a Kentia palm. I don't know what that one is. You can touch it though, it turns out. Um, so almost everything that we are, uh, that is around us is really as a result of the, the Industrial Revolution. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you're going to start to see some sense in which the other humans that are around you are also a result of the Industrial Revolution because it's changed us so, so much. So um, looking at this timeline where we have 2.3 million years ago at one end of the screen and then we have the present. Got to be careful not to step on my cake. Um, <laughs> we've got the, the present here. To give you some idea, I worked this out before I did the talk. Uh, to give you some idea of how quickly the changes that we're talking about are. So, um, for all of this time, we were up on two feet. We were mostly hunter-gathering, not having a fantastic diet, you know, eating raw meat for quite a lot of it, or tubers uh, with the soil still on them, so, you know, leaves lots of scratch marks on your teeth, and um, dead rat, you know, all sorts of stuff. The paleo diet was not, was not what they say in the books. Um, <laughs> So we then get to some, uh, some revolutions, and the, the big revolutions that I'm interested in are there's an agricultural revolution when um, we stopped moving and started farming, when somebody, some bright spark somewhere, thumbed a seed into the ground and just thought, right, I'm going to wait for that. You know, so that's when agriculture first began, and that's roughly that's roughly there's no precise date for this, but it's roughly about 10,000 years ago. So standard business card, standard business card. The agricultural revolution starts. It's about half of that starts then. So for the rest of that time, we were, you know, we were hunter gathering. The agricultural revolution starts about then. The metropolitan revolution, when we started gathering in um, large urban conurbations in cities like the ancient city of Ur in what is now Iraq. To get that one, we have to quarter the card. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's about 5,000 years ago. So with the earliest large settlements with about sort of more than 10,000 people in start then, you know, it gets better. Um, Metropolitan Revolution. Right, so the Industrial Revolution, you can't fold the card small enough, but the Industrial Revolution is... It's my university's uh, business card, so it's not very good quality paper, but it's quite thin. Um, that's the Industrial Revolution there. Okay, it's the thickness of a, of a, a thick piece of paper. And um, the time when we've been, you know, sitting on comfy chairs with um, carpeted floors, with, you know, shoes that are, are nice and spongy and bouncy, that, you know, my hair is not very thick. And I'd have to pick out, you know, one of my hairs and put it there. The rest of the time, we were, the human body was, or our DNA was living in environments for which it was not optimised, but which the DNA was expecting to find, really. So we started changing our environments really quite um, drastically, and the human body is responding. <laughs> now, what I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in suggesting that we need to go back to some sort of paleo lifestyle. You know, I, I really like my shoes. I really like the vegan ginger cake. Um, so none of it is about um, promoting a lifestyle that is, um, uh, yeah, that is hunter-gatherer. Instead, what I'm interested in is looking at aspects of, of lifestyles that have worked for humans in the past and then thinking about ways in which uh, either we can change our behavior by cherry-picking the best of theirs or looking at um, previous lifestyles to understand things that are going wrong for us at the moment. Um, this is just a frontispiece from a medical textbook um, from 1848. Oh yeah, there we are. From 1848. Um, so, and it's this was a um, medical textbook that was interested in the, in the pathology of uh, the spine. I'm going to come back to the back actually quite shortly. But um, one of the ways in which we really can see uh, the massive impact that our lifestyle is having on our bodies is actually thinking about our muscles and bones. 
So one of the main things that's going wrong for us today is the World Health Organization has, um, uh, has a top 10 of uh, global causes of death. And there's a couple of them that don't affect us so much in the West. Um, you know, COPD is much less of a problem um, in um, the UK and Europe than it is in certain parts of India, for example, where you know, we don't tend to do much cooking on live flames in, indoors. But uh, of those 10 um, causes of death, about seven of them are linked to activity levels. And so one of the things that I became very interested in was not only understanding <coughs> excuse me, what those activity levels were, but understand, trying to understand where that activity went, you know, like literally what happened to it. Um, and what, actually, what was it? What was a normal activity for a human, a human body? Now, one of the advantages of looking at um, ancient bodies is that, that much of the remains that we would like are still present. So when you look at the remains of um, the Turkana boy um, from about 1.6 million years, a, a, a Homo erectus uh, adolescent, um, he was probably about 15 or 16, um, found in um, Kenya. It's a nearly complete skeleton. I think the only things that are missing are like his, um, his talus bones and, and below. Um, but, uh, for example, a, a skeleton will leave behind the size of the muscle attachments to that skeleton. So you can actually uh, infer the uh, strength and fitness of, of the remains from just a couple of bones if you have the right bits of them. So studies have been done, um, studies have been done that have looked at um, how bone density has changed. So bone density, um, those of you that have done the sciences will know about Wolf's law and Davis's law that talk about um, hard tissues and soft tissues. But it's, it's very straightforward that our bodies try to be the best bodies that they can be for how we want to use them. So when you go to the gym, the first time you go to the gym, it's absolutely horrendous. Um, and then the second time, it, it's probably a little bit worse. <laughs> and then after that, it starts to get a bit, a bit easier because our bodies are trying to uh, adapt to the, to the load that they're being, being given. So um, one, of the, I mean, one of the reasons that runners actually get injured, especially new runners, is because these adaptations um, uh, don't all happen at the same time. So for example, uh, muscle adapts very, very quickly to changes of load, but bones and tendons don't. They take a bit longer. And in fact, after about three weeks of, of training, your bones are actually weaker than when you started because they're busy reconstructing um, uh, uh, so that they can uh, rebuild uh, uh, as, uh, um, uh, uh, as stronger. Anyway, anyway, anyway. So what we have is we have several studies that have looked at... Um, um, the bone density of hands, to, uh, there's a study being done actually at my university called the uh, University of Kent called GRASP that's looking at uh, the hand use of primates and early humans and they can, they can tell by mapping the um, bone density within the hands what the, what the hands were actually used for, were they used for uh, arboreal habitation, for living in trees or were they used for making lots and lots of you know, stone tools. Um, and their conclusion uh, is that from when we stopped, so for all of that long bit, when we transitioned into agriculture, it looks like our bone density dropped by about 30%. So it suggests that there was a, there was a, a quite steep drop, quite a steep diminution of uh, movement. So that's between Mesolithic and Neolithic, between uh, hunter-gatherer and early farmers, there was a drop of about 30%. And then there was also another study that was done in 2000 and um, it was published in 2017 that was about humeral uh, rigidity. And it looked at the upper arm bones of agriculturalist women from northern Eurasia, which is, basically, which is Germany. Um, um, and that's from about five, five, six thousand years ago. And what they discovered, what they discovered was that these, uh, these women... Uh, had really, you know, very strong, they were very, very strong armed. Um, and the study was able to conclude by saying that these agriculturalist women had stronger arm bones and therefore, you know, bigger muscle attachments were stronger than Olympic rowing teams today. So can you imagine 
you know, the, the amount of arm strength that you'd expect an Olympic rowing team to have, you'd, that's really what you'd anticipate to be the peak of, of human abilities. Um, but agriculturalist women, so women just working on the farm, um, about 5,000 years ago would have had stronger arm bones. That study was also able to conclude that, in general, that there's been a 30% drop between Neolithic to, um, um, from Neolithic farmers to uh, modern sedentary workers. So that's two drops of 30%. That means that, um, if you do your maths, we have less than half of the bone density that uh, then um, hunter-gatherers had. So our idea of what is normal for the human body is just, it's really warped. Um, our idea of what our DNA is expecting to find in the environment that it gets born into is, is really warped. So we, our relationship with movement is also uh, rather pathological and, and slightly strange. Um, let's see where we're going to go. I'm going to leave that for a moment. Um, so our relationship with movement is really um, pathological and strange. So if you think um, like the amount of movement that the environment encur encouraged in the human body for this, for this period of time, uh, up to about there, um, it seems that it's estimated that humans moved for about five to nine miles a day. How this can be estimated, I don't really know. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at the, the kind of movement patterns of hunter-gathering tribes like the, like the Hadza in, in, in uh, Tanzania or the Zmane in um, uh, lowland Ecuador, it looks like about five to nine miles is, is, is um, what our DNA is expecting. But it's obviously expecting a little bit more athleticism as well, um, like our ability to be able to chase down uh, prey to the, the point of exhaustion. And what's really happened here is that even though technology has been on the rise for the whole of human endeavor, really, we all know that it, it really, really accelerates in this bit, and especially in the space of a hair. And we know how much it's accelerated, because as we look around us, there is nothing not from the last 200 years around us. And what's, what that's meant is that our relationship to movement has become pathologized because um, we just don't understand what our body expects from our behavior. Um, our movement environment has changed drastically, so drastically, I'd say, that we are now uh, living in, in a movement famine. So there's two metaphors I'm going to use. One is the movement famine, the idea that we are, we are starved of movement in, in modern life. And the other metaphor I'm going to use is, is a metaphor of inheritance tax. So technology is all around us. I mean, it's literally, we're, we're swimming in it. We're like, it's like water to, to, to fish now. Um, and it's, uh, we are technological beings insofar as uh, we seek to solve problems technologically. Technology seeks to simplify things. It seeks to streamline them. And the person at the office that introduces more friction to a process is not really likely to be the popular one or to be promoted for, for slowing things down and making them more difficult. So part of our problem is, is that we, ha we, are, um, we have technological mindsets. The other problem is, like, if you think about this inheritance tax model, what happens is as, as each generation goes on, uh, some tax is taken away, some movement is taken from us, and then, then what that, what the, the movement environment that the next generation inherits becomes normal. And then that generation experiences some moderate change to that environment, and then they pass on um, and the environment again. And what happens is you go through several generations and we become like uh, withered aristocrats, you know, in, in crumbling houses where our, um, our wealth has been so taxed that there's nothing left. To make it clear what I'm, what I'm talking about, um, um, if you think about... Um, well, a rug, cleaning a rug. So to clean a rug in, in the 1930s, You'd move the furniture back off the rug, you'd roll up the rug, you'd sling it over your shoulder, you'd take the rug out into your backyard, you'd throw it over your, um, your washing line, and then you'd whack the bejesus out of it for about 20 minutes. Well, no, let's be honest, about 10 minutes. Um, you know, hard work until the clouds of dust stop, stop, um, stop choking you. 
Then you'd reverse the process, roll it back up, put it back over your shoulder, take it back into the living room, put it back, and then move all the furniture back, you know, being careful not to step on your ginger vegan cake. So the whole process uh, probably burns something in the region of about 200 calories. Um, yeah, about 200 calories. So that's just one, this is just one chore. Um, now, once you step up a couple of generations, um, Lots of audiences aren't quite old enough to get this first one, but I think you might get this one. <laughs> um, the U-Bank. Do you remember the U-Bank? Oh, it, it was a crap technology. It was like a, a thing with wheels with brushes on the inside that was supposed to whip the dust into the, into the chamber inside the U-Bank, and it was manually powered. But it did nothing. You know, it just sort of dispersed the, the dust around. <laughs> then you had early vacuum cleaners, which were built like Sherman tanks, you know, that you had to, you know, c c carry... And then even to work those, it was still, you know, it was easier. The job was being done more efficiently, but, you know, it still worked to use one of those old vacuums. Um, vacuums slimmed down a bit. Now they're battery powered, so there's no lead. You just take it off the wall and go, like, for, for, for five, seven, well, it has to be seven minutes, because that's how long the battery lasts. So you do your seven minutes, and then you hang it back up. So what's happening, each time these technologies in, are invented, the technology is taking a little bit more of your movement away, just a tiny bit, and you just think, oh, yeah, that's much more convenient. And now we're left at the point where we just go like that. You know, and a little robovac starts, starts going around the house, you know, and we sit on our sofa and pick our nose watching it, entertained by how, how much work we're not having to do. 200 calories... Eubank, Hoover, you know, Dyson, Robovac. Robovac, you know, how many calories is that? 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, that's a drop, movement drop of 1,000% in a few generations of, of technological invention. And seriously, go, go home, look around your house, look at the labour-saving devices and think about how many calories they are saving you. Um, but are they really saving you? They're, think about how many calories they are taxing you. They're making it more difficult for you to, to burn energy. Uh, the washing machine, the dishwasher, no one's yet invented a dishwasher that puts the stuff away for you. I find it's just easier not to use the cupboards, you just keep things in the dishwasher. Um, <laughs> you know, all of these things, they're making it harder for us to move. And we haven't even got on to thinking about what's happening in urban environments that makes it difficult for us to, to commute places. Um, okay, so one of, the, one of the solutions, maybe talk about this in questions, you want me to talk about for about 25 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we can maybe talk about how um, one of the things I often do is get people to look at each other's faces to see how much modern life has changed our faces, because it has, it's changed your, your facial appearance. Um, I can either talk about chairs or exercise. I think I'm going to talk about chairs. So uh, one of the things that's happened in, in this space of time, which is metropolitan revolution about there, is the sudden appearance of, of chairs. Now, chairs have been around for a really long time. They've been around for at least 5,000 years. But something, uh, the, the way that they've um, um, proliferated tells us something about what's happening to our, to our bodies. So, the number of chairs in the Iliad, actually that's not right, it's the number of chairs in Homer, which includes the Odyssey. Uh, the number of chairs in, in uh, Homer is zero, the number of chairs in the King James Bible, not one of these funky modern translations that has, you know, yeah, anyway. Um, the number of chairs in Hamlet is also zero, Shakespeare's Hamlet from 1603, something like that. Um, as a professor of, professor of English, I should really know that. Uh, I don't know this one either, King Lear, which I think is about 1607, 1608, 1609. Okay, now there's a clue in the, uh, uh, in the title of King Lear that, that tells us why there are three chairs mentioned. Um, I'm going to say it's my favourite um, uh, stage direction in, in Shakespeare, but it's not because there's a really funny one about somebody being followed by a bear. But um, the first, the entrance of King Lear, it's like enter King Lear uh, carried in a chair everyone kneels. So King Lear is like literally carried onto the stage, in, you know, sat down in a chair, and then everybody kneels. Chairs were associated with, with status and with power. If you think about how the, the, that word is still used in our language today, obviously we, we talk about chairs, we mean chairs, but we talk about the chairperson. My, when I got promoted to professor, it meant I got a chair. 
um, the idea of status and and power is still um, uh, still collects around that word. So. <clears throat> All of a sudden, Dickens's Bleak House, for the smart amongst you, will know that it was published 1852 to 1853. Again, in this, you know, paper-thin amount of time, we suddenly go from no chairs in any literature at all to 187 in, in Dickens's Bleak House. Now, fair enough, Dickens's Bleak House is like that long. You know, it is 900 pages, but that's still quite a lot more than, you know, Homer is also quite long. So chairs have suddenly spawned in the 1850s. Uh, it's not just about industry, although it, industry plays a big part. The, um, the classic bistro chair with the circular seat, uh, a woven uh, seat pad that you can't sit on for that long because it digs into your bottom. Um, and with the rounded legs, you'd see you know, any, um, any number of um, bistros in Paris still. That entered mass production in 1859, same year as... Um, uh, Darwin's Origin of Species. <laughs> that has no relevance, sorry. <laughs> um, so it's not just the fact that it's mass production, it's the fact that actually what was happening was our lifestyles were changing, making chairs more um, uh, more useful to us. Uh, in Dickens's Christmas Carol, 1843, you've got Bob Cratchit, and Bob Cratchit um, works with ledgers. He was an early office worker. Um, he, he's Kermit in, in uh, Muppet Christmas Carol. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you think, like, office work was still, it still had physical aspects to it. You know, nobody had cars, so everyone was um, getting to work, usually on foot. Um, and there were, you know, there were th these were big, heavy ledgers that people would work with. They'd, they'd take them to their desk. They'd sit on a stool, not a chair, but on a stool, uh, copy out ledgers, put them back. So filing was all, uh, like, quite a physical thing. Nothing compared to what was going on in the factories, but there was still physical aspects to it. At the beginning of the 19th century, no, about the 1830s, 1840s, the amount of the, uh, the working population that was doing sedentary work was about 0.04%, so a tiny, tiny amount. And then you fast forward to the present day. Ledgers have gone, uh, filing is gone, photocopying is gone. Um, you know, nobody does any of that anymore. All, we all just do this. Everything happens on the other side of a screen. So. Even sedentary work has become uh, incrementally uh, more sedentary through technological change. And now there's no, the Office for National Stat Statistics doesn't check, um, doesn't collect this kind of data. But in the US, 85% of, of um, work done is, is sedentary work. So there are now chairs everywhere. I mean, look how many are in this room. And this room is mostly empty. You know, most of the time, this room is empty. Think about how many chairs you have at home. So I counted up mine in the, when I was writing the book, and we had, I think it was 20 or 22. There are two of us. <laughs> there are two of us. We live in half a house, um, you know, uh, and we had 20. And this is, not, this is not abnormal. Once you start adding up all the ones that you have, and you just think, wow, how many do I need? Anyway... Um, Squats are what we used to do. We used to rest in the squat. I'm running out of time, actually. So um, chairs is just one of the big changes that we're seeing in modern life. And you know, chairs reduce bone de density in our backs, our pelvis, our hips, our knees, our, our ankles. They're even making our feet bigger, uh, which I can talk about in questions if, if that's appropriate. Um, <clears throat> So one of the many changes, this is just one of the many, many changes that our bodies are having to experience, and they're doing their very best to adjust to. But I think the, their struggle is being seen in the kinds of the big diseases, the big illnesses that we have. Changes in bone density. So bone density is just one example, but for example, um, uh, three million people in the UK uh, have sought medical help for uh, osteoporosis. Um, half a million people in the UK um, have been hospitalised as a result of osteoporosis. Osteoarthritis is an even bigger deal. You know, and these are these are just diseases directly related to, to bone density. At any given moment, 540 million people in the world have back pain. So when you go to a, an osteopath and they crunch your back and you go, ah, someone else somewhere in the world has gone, ah, oh! you know, they've just got it as you've as you've got rid of it. Back pain is, the, you know, it's the, it's the leading cause of, of global disability, and it's 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 connected to um, to chair use. 
But all of these things are really about a general um, um, weakening of our bodies. And the reason our bodies are getting so weak is because they are trying to adjust to the fact that we don't need them. We're not, we're not using them. They're trying to adjust to the fact that they don't want to be spending, expending calories, cal carrying muscle that we don't need. You know, these are these muscles, these gluteal muscles, these six muscles that we have in our in our bums. Um, they're not supposed to be used as cushions. <laughs> you know, and as soon as you sit down on them, they, you know, they um, they switch off. And as soon as you go like that. All the epaxial and hypaxial musculature in your trunk also switches off and is becoming, and it's very, very slowly in the process of atrophying. And once you've done it for a couple of decades, um, you end up being one of the 540 million people in the world that's, that's struggling with back pain. So, if I had another half an hour, I'd talk to you about exercise, but I haven't. Um, what we really need is we need a much better sense of what our bodies are expecting, what our DNA was expecting when it was born into this world. Because the problem is, is that um, we've made this world, but we're, we are not made for this world. We're made for quite a different place. And the way in which we can see that argument being presented to us is in the, um, the billions, the hundreds of billions that we globally have to spend on healthcare each year. Thank you very much.